What's going on, everybody? In the studio today to discuss that oh-so-ever-familiar season for approach grafting junipers. Now, if we have our druthers about optimal times to graft, the best physiological time to be grafting junipers with the approach grafting methodology, which let's just clear it up right now. We're not talking about a scion graft where we would take one of these and then we would stick it into that branch. That would best be done in the early spring just as the buds start to wake up, okay, to do a scion graft uh, with one of these smaller pieces. But when we start to talk about the entirety of a branch being grafted onto a tree or the approach graft methodology, and we want to maximize the physiological response, the ideal time to be grafting and capturing the immediate momentum of the tree's vascular productivity is in that post-push, post-flush hardened state where energy reaccumulation is taking place and we get that small spurt of spring vascular growth. But there's a problem with that time of year and grafting on junipers from the perspective of delicacy and sensitivity of the tissue. Because we recognize that as junipers are in that sort of early summer, late May, early June, this is early summer period of time, they are rapidly moving a lot of water through their tissue. And that optimal physiological time comes with the delicacy of that very moist tissue, the central xylem having a lot of water, and easily separating from the cambial layer. When we're handling the whips and we're shaving down 50%, it's very challenging at that time of year to avoid doing damage to the remaining tissue that you're hoping becomes the tissue that supports that branch and becomes that foliar mass that you're grafting on. So we recognize that the approach grafting methodology and grafting in general is ideally performed at a time where we both have a positive physiological response as well as all of the factors working for us, right, to contribute to the success of the operation. Because you'll never have an easier graft than the first time you graft. If you've ever regrafted a graft, whether it be an approach graft or a scion graft, that second time around, you've already burned up optimal position. You've already done a significant amount of tissue reduction. You've already altered the vascular flow of the tree. It is challenging to get a second time around to take and really thrive. And so we try to maximize this first time around. And as a result, just as the buds are starting to move, we say, listen, we could be scion grafting. But instead, we're going to come back in here and we're going to approach graft because we have a plethora of Itoigawa whips that we've just separated from our mother stock plant. And it's an optimal time in terms of circumstances aligning with the possibility of physiological success. Yes, we will get vascular productivity on a tree that is not repotted. We never want to be grafting on a tree we've freshly repotted in the spring. Yes, we will have vascular productivity over the spring as a result of the focus not being on the root system so much as on the foyer mass, foyer production. And we're capturing that water, sugar starch flow, and then we'll be really developing that vascular tissue with that return in early summer. But we will have already placed the graft, okay? And the graft is not going to go bad. The tissue, cambium to cambium, uh, matching and pairing of the tissue is not going to expire. It's not going to grow stale. It's not going to somehow dry out. It's not going to fail if we graft at this early spring period of the year. We're going to piggyback on a little bit of movement, capture that late vascular productivity in the post-flush hardened state, but we're really doing it at this time of year to avoid stripping the cambium off of the grafts and the native juniper that we're grafting to. Okay? So I've got a, a, a pile of grafts here. Now we get to dig into the tree. Okay, very famous tree at Mirai. This is the Harau tree. Uh, we have a few hairy Harau junipers that were collected by Harry uh, and some of the people around Harry that we really valued. Um, this was donated to us by Bill Hutchinson back in 2010, maybe the first year I had Mirai. I believe this was one of the first trees that I ever put on the first Bonsai Mirai website. Uh, stylistically, this is an MC squared pot, Charles and Michelle Smith, uh, who I believe are in uh, Georgia or Tennessee in the southeastern United States. And I've always loved this combination because I think the fin formation of deadwood on California junipers that they're iconically known for and really the fin characteristic in Southern California sort of prized for that abnormality of that fin creation of deadwood, which comes from the constantly receding live vein leaving behind that constantly uh, evolving and expanding deadwood, right? 
the, the, the combination of this aesthetic oddity with this very unconventional pot, I've put this tree into more conventional pots, I've put this tree into traditional pots, I've put this tree into an oval Ron Lang before, and it never had the punch factor of this really wonderful and out of the box MC squared ceramic. So I like the combination, but the problem with this juniper is that every single time that we've wired this tree, and this was wired maybe 14, 16 months ago, styled, dialed in, looked beautiful. This is how it responds to the styling and the wiring process. The branches that we wire end up getting very, very weak, very, very leggy. You can see these branches up at the top. They tend to push vigorous growth from the crotches of the tree. Let me just show you that right here. They push these vigorous sprigs from the crotches. The longer sort of uh, woodier branches tend to expire and we start to have to rebuild with these elongating sprigs from the crotches. So any of these vigorous branches that you see were elongating sprigs from the crotches. Now I've tried pruning off the sprigs from the crotches to try and guide the energy into those older branches that had shape and form. And uh, ultimately what I ended up with was a very weak tree because I took out the vigorous pieces. Why does a juniper uh, potentially behave in this manner? Any number of physiological reasons, genetic uh, anomalies, et cetera. But we do recognize that this is a male foliar type on California juniper, juniper californica. And we see a very major difference in the behavior of male junipers versus female junipers in the California juniper realm. This is coarser, has longer inner nodes, has leggier foliar mass. But the biggest thing I notice about this specific tree, and I'm not saying this is a blanket statement to all California junipers, the biggest thing I notice about this specific tree is that it does not like to necessarily be wired and have all of its branches drop down into the positions we need. It pushes from the crotches, those grow up. If we prune them off, vigor is lost. Now we have to keep those, we can't wire those. It's time to change out the foyer mass of the tree to start to shift the foyer response and character that's occurring when we're styling this and handling it as, as a bonsai. And I am the first to say I'm quite resistant, ultimately, to changing out native foliage if I can avoid it. This is a circumstance, and we've talked about this before on other junipers that we've grafted. Weeping forms of junipers, we wire them up, they die back, right? These are trees that we graft to improve the quality and behavior of the tree because the native foliar mass, native physiology of that foliar mass, genetics, et cetera, are not in line to allow us to be able to work these trees as bonsai. Now, this is a spectacular tree from the scale and size of the tree the scale and size of the fin. It's very rare to find small California junipers that have this characteristic. And this is really where I felt like, wow, what a spectacular specimen. Let's try to keep it Californica as long as we can. And alas, we have thrown in the towel, okay? So what we're gonna do here today and what makes this different than other approach grafting uh, scenarios that we've worked with is this, is this is a tree that's styled. This is a tree that has branching scaffolding, primary, secondary, tertiary, and how do we approach grafting over a tree that has these circumstances already worked out? Because we start to say, okay, I could use the scion grafting methodology to save each one of those pieces and regrow that branch over the next three, four, five years to get any sort of developmental length on that that I can then wire into position and start to build the tree or I can utilize that approach graft on very specific branches strategically placed in regions, knowing that the approach graft gives me a fully comprehensive branch that I can start to utilize within the first year of that graft taking to be able to build that a little bit quicker and a little bit more efficiently, but also, right, when we start to think about that, necessitating accurate strategy of grafting over a pre-styled tree whose shape we value and whose shape we want to continue forward in the, in the direction that we've already headed, right? But with that different foliar mass that gives us the capacity to further pursue excellence in bonsai, all right? So we're talking strategy of branching in locations. How do we determine the location? How do we determine what branch to be grafting? And how do we maximize the success of that graft as we start to apply our approach grafts to the tree, okay? So 
without further ado, first move in the action of grafting, I'm gonna get rid of all unnecessary weak and spindly branches. I'm gonna get rid of all dead branches to have all of the clutter of, of the branching system out of the way so that I have a very workable system. Now, I'm only gonna be taking wire off of the pieces that I'm grafting. I'm going to be leaving the wire on the pieces that I am not grafting. And you say, well, why? Why would you do that? Because I do, with the pieces that have wire and are growing vigorously, I do want to try and maximize the health of this tree after the graft. Okay, so that means the wire allows me to move my branches that are still contributing to the energy system of the tree. Even if I'm not grafting on it, the native foliage that exists on that branch is still contributing to the energy system of the tree. By leaving it wired, I can move those branches into positions that can photosynthetically um, perform around and kind of manipulate them to accommodate the additional mass and loss of light that comes inherently with grafting uh, whips onto this tree that are gonna occupy a tremendous amount of space. They're gonna more than double the foyer mass uh, that is competing for the space in the tree. And that's really where leaving it wired and having the capacity to maintain strength while these grafts take, which are, is gonna be necessary. Tree has got to be growing vigorously in order for a graft to take. A lot of people say, hey, I've got a weak tree. I've got a tree that didn't come out of collection with many roots. Do I have the capacity to graft roots onto that tree to save it? No. A graft takes because you have a tree in, in an extreme circumstance of health. It's moving a tremendous amount of resources. And as a result of that resource movement and that tremendous state of health, we have the creation of vascular tissue in the form of the cambial layer that merges with the cambial layer of the other healthy growing piece, which is the whip that we're gonna be grafting on. And the vigor of those two pieces cause them to grow together. When we have weakness and strength, there is no way they're growing together. When we have limited vascular flow, limited photosynthetic capacity, limited moisture mobility in a tree because it doesn't have roots, because the foliage is weak, grafting is not gonna save you. It's absolutely not gonna save you, right? So when we start to think about these things, really working to create the space so that we can accommodate the grafts, having this piece wired so that we're able to maximize photosynthetic efficiency, which will increase our success rate of grafting as well as the rapidity with which the grafts take, right? And we think about that in terms of the more resources this tree is moving, the faster and the more robust vascular productivity it's going to have. So we wanna be trying to max out every single piece of this tree's physiological behavior to empower the grafts to really have uh, a high level of success and a rapid, a rapid level of success, okay? Because having a graft take and having it sputter along for three years to try and get something that's usable, that's really not a successful grafting session if that's what our, our aftermath of grafting looks like, right? We want it to immediately uh, be propelled into something that has uh, a far higher degree of physiological behavior and response. Okay, so I'm taking away some of these uh, spindly pieces and I am leaving, even in this lower section here, leaving some of these weaker pieces, these long leggy pieces, just so that I have as much vascular productivity through photosynthesis as I possibly can. Now, some of you are gonna be saying, but hey, Ryan, I thought junipers uh, were vein specific, junipers move resources vertically, not laterally. Why would leaving foliage on pieces that you're not grafting improve the health of the tree? This all comes down to uh, sugar starch productivity generating root growth, root growth having the capacity to support the enhanced foliar load of that grafted resource. As well as when we start to think about balance of water and oxygen in the root system, if we heavily reduce the foliar mass of a tree that we're trying to ramp up its productivity, then we are decreasing the water mobility, we're decreasing the ability for nutrition to move through the tree, and we are decreasing its growth rate. Okay, so even for a vein specific growth habit of vertical linear transport of resources, having branches in the periphery still improves the quality of the tree and the health and the rate of growth and the sugar starch accumulation because it increases and improves that balance of water and oxygen in the containerized environment, okay? So I'm just gonna go through here. I'm gonna get rid of all of these uh, pieces that could be in the way that are occupying space and that are kind of creating a little bit of a conundrum. We'll come back and let's really lock into our strategy around grafting and how we go about that process of choosing and selecting our locations to execute these pivotal graphs.
cleaned up and you can see there's there's quite a bit of unnecessary stuff. I mean, the, the, the motivation, it wasn't for lack of effort that we are grafting over this tree. It's not a, it wasn't the, it, it wasn't the, automatic go-to for our technique at Mirai to graft over this tree. But now here we are. We're, he we're here in the, in the position that we're in. We've given it a solid fight in 13 years of effort. We couldn't get it to be any tighter, any more compact, or any more successful. I think we can officially accept, okay, it's, it, it is time. And I'm going to start with the key pieces of the tree that are giving it its character. And one of the most important pieces of the tree, and whenever I'm thinking about grafting, I'm thinking, how do I preserve the woody structure that matters? And on a juniper, how do I preserve the branches that support live veins that matter? Now, in the case of this tree, there's only one live vein running up the outside of this tree right here. So we know that any branch is gonna contribute to the preservation of that, but inside of it, this branch that drops down right here over the deadwood, this really interesting, and let me just go ahead and see if I can get a little bit, there it is. Uh, go ahead and go back to that three-quarter cam, Jesus. That right there. Notice that branch right there where it comes up and it's just this massive drop. That is an incredibly interesting feature. Now this is a little bit too thick to really want to approach graft on in that section right there. And I would hate for that line to be uh, obstructed or jeopardized by a bulge or swelling from a graft. But I do know that I need at least one graft on this section of the tree. Now this section of the tree occupies a fairly healthy and substantial uh, uh, amount of tissue in terms of the entire left side of this tree. So ideally, not just one, but if we could get two grafts, one that's gonna form sort of a, a, a rear section for depth, one that's gonna form a foreground section to give me the ability to build something into this region, I feel like we will have a good distribution that supports the major structure, keeps the live veins intact, and also gives us foliar mass in a location where it's usable to be continuing the general direction that we were carrying the shape. Obviously with new branching and new foliage, the shape is going to have to change a little bit, but we are building ourselves the best possible solution to perpetuate what we've already started, okay? So let's just start with this front section here, knowing we're gonna put one graft on this front section. We could do two. I'm gonna say, I'm, gonna, I'm very confident in my grafting skills. We get a good execution. If we get one good execution, We'll go ahead and we'll save that one and call it good. And when I look at these, I've got three different scenarios that exist inside of, and actually maybe four, and we'll talk about that fourth one. Three different scenarios that contribute to the dropping portion right here, okay? I've got this uh, far right scenario. And when I look at the tips of the branches of the far right scenario, there really isn't a tremendous amount of health or quality that's existing inside of these. I mean. Literally, the branches come from all the way up here. First time we hit foliage mass is right down here. So when I start to think about, does this have that tremendous, vigorous, and aggressive? So when I see this minimal number of tips, I'm thinking, gosh, can I generate the kind of vascular productivity here with these long, spindly branches that would potentially lead to a good graft? I'm gonna say this is a very poor selection. Now, if this is all that we had, it's all that we had. And how would we go about improving that? we would raise those tips up and try to give them as much photosynthetic efficiency without any foliar mass over the top of them, obstructing them, and really start to foster as much as we possibly can the health in those branches, okay? When I look at the leftward branch, okay, in terms of this grouping of three, I see a very similar spindliness to this leftward branch. I do have a little more foliar mass, there is a little bit of back budding on this, but ultimately this is a very, very spindly sort of foliar minimal branch. Okay? But when I look at the middle branch of this scenario, and I put all of this foliage together, the middle branch of this scenario has got elongating vigorous tips that have nice mature foliage. It's got a multitude of foliar mass. It has almost the same foliar mass on this one branch as the other two branches have combined. This is by far and away going to be our focal point. And I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give that a little white mark just so that I understand with my chalk have that little white mark, I delineate, that's gonna be my grafted piece. Okay, now I have this fourth piece 
that exists right here, sticking out of the top of this branch. And this seems like it would be an incredibly high likelihood of success. This is probably the most vigorous branch in this region. We said, listen, every time we drop these branches down, they get very weak. So this branch growing off the top, which was an adventitious shoot that we then turned into a branch because every time we wired it, we lost something. This seems like a natural response and a natural exception that this would be the graftable piece. However, if we're trying to build, and this is where we're saying it's very different to graft a tree that has never been styled, where you're putting grafts in areas and you're saying, listen, I just need foliage. I need foliage in this region. I need foliage in this region. I need foliage in this region. For this tree, we know what this tree's shape can be. We're not going to be able to duplicate it uh, in, in, in its totality, but we can put branches in the locations that give us the opportunity to be successful. Am I ever going to get this upward branch to have a downward position that will duplicate the drop that I want on the left side of this tree. And the answer is if I graft on that region, the grafted region is not bendable, I would have an up, I would have an out, and then I could bend it down, poor branch shape, right? Not the aesthetic that we're looking for. Even though this would be a really, really good branch to go ahead and graft with, I'm going to hold off on that and I'm going to be working this middle piece that felt like it was the nice merging of all of the different elements. Okay, and watch what I'm going to do here. Because I'm going to be putting a foreign foyer mass onto this piece and I've got this upper vigorous piece that's growing with, exceptional, with an exceptional amount of strength, the same thing is going to happen when I try to graft it as when I try to lower it. Right? It's going to be resistant to that new foyer mass, that reduced uh, vascular load that's moving through that shaved down grafting region. I'm going to take this upward growing piece and we say, listen, I want to leave the energy on the tree. I want this to be vigorously growing. When we start to talk about placing grafts in areas where there is a stronger branch, where there is maybe a little bit of a, a, a more vigorous scenario, I have to disempower that branch slightly. Now, I'm not taking it off but I'm reducing the foyer load on this, I'm increasing the, the, tr the transpiration, and I'm increasing the photosynthetic productivity of the piece that I'm grafting in that region on that portion of resource, knowing that that adventitious shoot turned into the most vigorous branch and it exists on the upper side, but I don't want to fully cut it off because I still need to leave myself in the event I don't have grafting success, or just to keep the resources moving through the tree, that piece, I can't cut it off, I don't want to cut it off, Okay, all right, that's how we transition that energy to set ourselves up for grafting success, okay? So I'm gonna shift to the back now, and I'm just gonna take a look at these back branches. Now these are all much, much thinner branches. Thinner branches in the approach grafting methodology, a little bit more challenging, both in the scion grafting as well as in the approach grafting methodology. A little bit more challenging to graft onto and have success, but I do have a really strong little section right here Along the top of this branch where I have this kind of spindly piece, I have this moderately vigorous piece, and then I've got this other slightly spindly piece, okay? I've got a thin spindly piece that exists down here, right? Very, very thin and spindly. Let me see if I can show you that. There we go. I've got this thin spindly piece. Not an acceptable branch to approach graft on. I need some girth. I need the branch that I'm grafting to to be the same diameter as the, as the scion I'm grafting onto it. We shave off 50% of the, of the native branch, we shave off 50% of the scion, we gra graft them together, and the diameter of that branch will be equivalent to what we started with. So when I look at this, I don't have any air layers that are you know, a crochet needle thick. I don't have any air layers that are even, you know, pencil thick might be the smallest air layer that we created and it's thickened over the past year that those roots have developed. So this spindly piece doesn't even have a mate to be grafting to, but I do have the beef and the bulk of this more structural piece moving through here. The problem with that is I've got some sprigs growing out of it that are gonna be competing for the strength. Let me take those off. And the other problem with it is I've got this branch right here that's really preventing my access to be able to graft. Now again, I want to keep as many branches as I possibly can, but sometimes in the grafting process, branch removal is what gives rise to the capacity to be grafting on the side that the branch was removed. So automatically, if I'm going to cut this off, I'm going to create a wound on this piece. I'm going to unwire here and get this out of the way so that I'm not fighting or competing with the wire. 
slightly embedded into that branch. Let me go ahead and get that out of the way there. Okay, that piece is out. Now watch what happens here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut this. Now I know that my graft is gonna be shaving right along that location. Let me just turn that for you. My graft is gonna be shaving right along the location, right where that branch was removed, right there. That's gonna be my grafting surface, okay? So I'm gonna have a minimal, I'm gonna to have to be very accurate, I'm gonna have a minimal, uh, maybe inch and a quarter, inch and a half, surface area for my graft to be taking there, but I'm piggybacking on the separation or the removal of that branch because I've already opened up the tissue. I take a razor blade and I finally cut that and now I can merge a graft to that. We should see that have success. We do know the longer the grafting site, the higher the success rate. So the longer that those two pieces are put into contact, the greater our success rate. The smaller that piece gets, the lower our success rate. But ultimately, we don't want a never-ending graft junction because we do want to have mobility. So it's not bad to have an inch to work with, an inch and a half to work with. You just have to be that much more concise about the accuracy of your technique, okay? Now you might be asking, hey, you're doing all of this strategizing. Why are you not grafting as you go? We have a tremendous number of grafts that are gonna go on this tree. Eight to 10 grafts are gonna be placed on this tree. If I'm grafting now without strategizing, where does the root mass of the whip go? Where does the physical whip itself go? How do these whips overlap each other inside of this system where all of the root mass is gonna be held inside of the central core here? If I'm not strategizing about that process and that overlap, I'm gonna have whips and other approach graphs that are in the way of the pr approach graphs that I wanna make in different areas of the tree, I always wanna go through this process of strategizing first and that's why I'm marking things out. Okay, let's go to the back of the tree. I have this kind of long spindly guy here coming off of a branch that is uh, a, a good size up top. It's not a very, not a very active or, or strong or healthy piece and it's a bar branch that's forming a structural flaw to a much more vigorous piece here. Because I'm forming some structural flaws, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take that spindly weak piece off. That also opens the door for my grafts on this side to have a lot more photosynthetic capacity by taking that piece off. No harm, no foul in terms of removing things that are in the way, okay? Now, I've got this beautiful structural branch dropping down right here. This to me feels like I could go about the process, and you notice this right here, okay? That's about a pinky diameter. A good, strong air layer is gonna be about that same size. We talked about this branch being, you know, more or less a thumb diameter, and all of a sudden we start to say, gosh, I don't wanna carve into that. That's gonna be an unsightly little area there. This piece and this run right here, this is a spectacular little opportunity inside of grafting to be able to take advantage of a very strong piece with a lot of resources. Now, when I look at those resources, this is again one of these hanging branches. I've got this accumulated foliar mass that is all contributing to that. That's a lot. That's a really strong, healthy amount of foliar mass that has the ability to contribute to rapid uh, graft success. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get rid of this structural wire and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna try to pick out a nice straight run along this. I don't want to try to graft on a curve neither on the inside nor the outside. I want to try to graft on a nice straight run there so I give myself that opportunity. Now notice I have the ability with the beginning of that shoulder left untouched by the graft by not grafting on that curve, I have the ability to still bend this structurally and move this from that location prior to the graft site. Okay, I like that. Now I've got this vigorous piece that's existing at the base of it. Again, this was another sprig. What do we do with those sprigs, those uh, vigorous pieces? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna disempower this a little bit. I'm gonna take away some of those elongating tips so that I just don't have that same level of competition fighting for that, uh, that, that uh, allocation of resources coming from the roots. And we have to understand in grafting that the graft is always, 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 the graft is always going to be subservient to the native foliar mass, okay? All right, so we've disempowered that. Now, right next door to it, I have another one of these fairly vigorous sections, and I've got a few little pieces. Let me just get rid of these. I didn't see this the first time. A few little pieces of garbage, okay? I've got this piece right here, and this piece is existing off of a very, 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 very nice 
Very, very nice structural member here. Now this is intertied with dead wood. I've got branching above it. I'm gonna be grafting here as well. I would love, I would love to give myself with these two different opportunities, I would love to give myself the ability to put a graft here and a graft here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take advantage of that straight run and I'm gonna take advantage of that opportunity, okay? When we start to look at this, I'm gonna be grafting, excuse me, I'm gonna be grafting right here and I'm also gonna be grafting right in here to try and change out that branching and give myself that structural element. That takes care of the majority of the rear portion of our tree just in that single decision that we made in order to be able to maximize those graphs, okay? All right, let's swing around to the right side. Let me reorient you here. Right side of the tree is over there. Let's swing around and let's see what we got here. Now, this is another major, major portion of the tree because this is actually the defining branch that dropped into this negative space that occupies this hole that closes down this region and that gives us the capacity to really do something spectacular uh, in terms of that, that character, that, you know, that joie de vivre that the tree can have to really express some style and some, and some interest and some diversity and uniqueness. And I've got two sections to this branch. Okay, I've got two sections to this branch. I've got this piece on the right side here that kind of knuckles out into two strong regions. And I've got a, a pencil sized branch right here with a little bit of a grafting run on it. And I've got you know, more of a pinky sized branch right here that has a grafting run on it. And when I say a grafting run has, gives me at least an inch, inch and a half of length really to be looked at as a, as a viable grafting resource. But I have these other two pieces over in here that are existing off of the second part. And this is a really beautiful grafting site right here. This one gives me a tremendous amount of opportunity to be able to establish a great graft. Now I have another one underneath it here that has a little bit less foliage on it, but nevertheless could potentially be utilized. And when I get into these circumstances, I wanna be saying, which one gives me the better line? This has a little bit of a, of a tea kettle kind of arcing line here. This one drops straight down right there. Do you see that? Straight down. Really, really beautiful uh, opportunity to, to, to graft here. So when I start to see this, automatically I'm saying, I would rather have this dropping branch. We know we can orient the tips up to improve its strength, but this piece over the top of it, this piece is really uh, in the way of this lower branch getting the kind of resources that it will need. I'm gonna take off the stronger pieces of this branch above it, just so that I can open up this line. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna be grafting on that really beautiful downward dropping line to try and maximize the quality of the piece that we put into this as a grafting unit. Okay, that takes care of the left. Now let's come back to the right. Now that we know that our graft is gonna be on the far left side of the left fork of our main branch defining on the right side of the tree, I have a lot more opportunity to play inside of this space. And I might even say, you know, because I've got such a good setup over there, maybe I do go ahead and try to hit both of these with different graphs from different locations just to see if we can capture the opportunity. Now this one here has a sprig that's coming out of the crotch. I'm gonna take away this sprig, which also is the most vigorous piece. And I'm gonna open up a nice grafting site right there, right on the inside of that. That's a good solid run. I know my root system can sit back in here. My whip can pass through here. That can be a real beefy whip. I'm gonna get a good strong branch that's built out of it and I'm gonna be able to bend it right past that graft. I like that, I like that, okay? But when I come back to this other one that also has a really nice strong character coming off the top of the branch here, I don't mind that on a juniper. This is where you drop the kids off at school. If you remember, we drop down when we have a branch at the top of that. I'm gonna come right across the top of that branch right here. Now all of a sudden, my root system can sit here. My whip can go there. My root system can sit up there. My, root, my whip can go here. So when I start to think about 
the success of grafting, I'm guessing that I'm gonna wanna graft this one first, set the roots here, graft this one second, set the roots above that and use a thinner part of the extended whip. And I'm probably gonna wanna graft this big boy third. I'm gonna wanna put the roots back in here, which could potentially start to clash with that. So I've gotta be very calculated. I'll wanna graft these two first before I even get to this. I've got one, two, three graphs to take place here. So, so far I've got three, four, five, six, seven, and now we're at the apex of the tree, okay? Now, the apex of the tree. Obviously, I've got a multitude of situations going on here. I could graft along the big thick run here. I would love to have apical mobility by being able to move this whole thing. So if I graft right there, I lose my apical mobility. I've got a good strong piece here. These pieces are losing strength. I've got about a pencil diameter. I've got a pencil diameter here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna graft over the top here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna graft over the top here. Okay, I've got a much smaller branch that has some vigor right in here, which does appeal to me. I've got a very spindly branch down in here that doesn't offer me much. Okay, so I've got spindly, I'm not gonna use it. I've got a thicker branch here that's not very strong. I've got two at the top here, but I have this one. I have this one lone ranger coming around the back here, boom, bada bing, right there. Okay, and this is what's gonna give me branching and foliage over in this right portion of the canopy. I'm gonna come in there and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna attack that piece. So I've got three more in the top. What does that leave us with? That leaves us with three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 graphs. What did I say we were gonna do today? 10 graphs, 10 to 12 graphs? Huh, that works. All right, so we're gonna construct from the inside out, from the bottom to the top. And I always like to start my grafting with a nice, open, available, and efficient graft site. So I'm gonna take the wire off of the site that I'm gonna be grafting. Okay, I'm gonna cut the wire off of that site that I'm gonna be grafting, and I'm also gonna be cutting the wire off of anywhere that could be competing for the space that I need to be able to place my graft successfully. So if I have big heavy wire out here that would push my graft away from the branch, I wanna be getting rid of that, okay? So we're gonna be doing this one, roughly a pencil-sized uh, grafting situation or scenario. And I'm looking for an appropriately sized scion that can really maximize the effectiveness of that graft, okay? So I'm looking at the central stem. I'm also looking at the contour of my whip to potentially see. I'm also looking at how that whip is gonna sit in there. And automatically, look what's happening here. As I'm strategizing that whip, look at what's happening to this other graft site. If I graft that one first without thinking, how am I gonna get in here and shave and carve underneath this piece to get that one done, okay? I'm gonna set this aside. This is the perfect graft. My whip should be able to come in here and the roots can occupy this pocket inside of here right, so that I can graft this second, but I first need to attack this piece right here in terms of my grafting hierarchy. This one is a little bit more of a thumb-sized graft, so let me come back and let me see if I can get a little bit more of a thumb-sized scenario to work with and conceptualize. Okay, so if I come in here and keep your chalk at the ready, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna back off this air layered site just a smidge, just so that I have access. Okay, and I might have to feed this in from the other side, but for now, just to do all the measuring and stuff, let's just see if we have Let's just see if we have synergy. Oof. Oof, oof, oof. We have synergy of that. Does that give me the appropriate size? Has a little bit, I've got a little bit of resistance. Let me flip it over. See if I can play on that arc. Oh, that feels a little bit better. Play on the arc of the branch. I don't like that. I don't find that to be, I don't find that to be successful. So let me see if I can get a little bit different. This feels like this has some potential. 
This is a very, very serious branch to be grafting there. Just gonna pull back my air layer again, expose a little bit more tissue, and then rebutton these up so that they hold water when we water these after the graft execution. All right. See what this one gives us. This is a pretty beefy branch here, but I give myself, with a beefy branch, I give myself a little bit more space. I also have a little bit of curvature in here that I can take advantage of. Let me go ahead and just to see what we're doing, I'm gonna clean up some of these branches at the base, just some of these smaller spindly pieces so that I can actually start to conceptualize whether this is right. Now, I don't wanna, I don't want to commit too much, okay, because this might need those branches to be grafted. If it doesn't work here, it might work in another area. So let me just see what I got. In you go. In you go. Let's see if we can play on that curve. I play on that natural curve. There you are. Oh my goodness. Got a natural curve for days. Okay, so I have this piece ready to go right here. And this has the ability to absolutely, has the ability to absolutely work. I've got another graft coming here. The roots are gonna be up here. This is not gonna be obstructing anything to graft over the front, so I feel good. Go ahead and bring me in tight, Jesus. Okay, so when I look at this, I've got this graft coming here. My roots sit inside here. I've got a perfect marriage there. I love this. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mark this, right? And when I mark this, I'm holding that graph together right where it's going to merge, and I'm just marking the top margin, and then I'm going to come along the bottom, and I'm going to mark the bottom margin. Now watch how cool this is, okay? When I bring this piece out, and I've marked my bottom margin, I've mar marked my bottom margin, and I've marked my top margin, that space between them, this is the space that I need to be shaving off in order for that graph to be successful, okay? That top and bottom margin. And I'm gonna have to get rid of these little branchlets that are along that run in order to be able to shave this down and tape it together correctly, okay? Now the other thing that I have happening here, whenever I use uh, air layered whips to graft with, Okay, my graft is gonna be sitting like this, and let me just show you. My graft is gonna be sitting sideways. Notice where the water inlet is here. We see that water inlet? Yep, that's where I'm getting the water into the graft. You can see the roots through the plastic bag here, the little orange rootlets, little red rootlets right in there. You see those red rootlets, okay? So if I'm sideways, I can't hydrate this. So now that I know my grafting orientation, I'm just gonna take a moment to unwrap one portion, okay? I'm gonna take this plastic and just loosen it slightly, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna reorient my plastic to accommodate that new position. Okay, so I'm gonna loosen my plastic up just slightly, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna rotate my plastic without doing damage to the roots. Okay, I'm gonna reorient my plastic to now accommodate my water inlet at that new location. There we go, there we go. And there's some nice sensitive little rootlets in there. Don't worry, you have enough inside of your sphagnum that it should not be an issue, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna reduce as much as I possibly can the length of this, the length of my air layer here. Take that stub back, these were just arbitrarily cut off the the tree I have enough to secure to right here. Come back in with my plastic. Underneath. Okay, and now I can pull this back like we did before to expose as much grafting location as possible. Tie that in with my wire. And I am all set to both hydrate this as well as graft with it, okay? Completely reconstituted in terms of what we're trying to do here.
That's nice. Nice little, nice little easy way. And I can even sort of reform the, the sphagnum a little bit inside of there. Nice easy way to adjust. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's start with the scion. The scion has more flexibility than the, the, the larger parent branch that we're grafting. I'm gonna take off these small little branchlets here. I've got more than enough branching up in this region here. I've got my outer margins here. I want a really nice, fresh, sharp blade to get into this grafting process. Okay, now I always like to do this right over my leg, shaving away from myself. And again, the secret to grafting is this thumb, right? This is this thumb pushing my grafting blade. I'm holding here. I'm not using this hand to push. I'm using my thumb. Okay, and my thumb has all of the control. When my thumb is fully extended, I am out of the ability to push, okay? And what that does is it just gives me a little bit more accuracy and I can just continue to advance. You notice my fingers down here, lightly holding. I've got the root system here, okay? I don't wanna be torquing too much, but it just allows me to, to advance my graft cuts and I wanna, I wanna make nice flat. Notice how I stay in here. I don't want to be whittling a little bit on this angle. Excuse me, let me go here. I don't want to be whittling a little bit on this angle and a little bit on this angle. I want to be dead flat. So when I enter here, I enter, okay, and I don't want to come out of this. Now that I'm in, I don't want to come out. Thumb, 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 okay? Stay in it. Stay in it. Notice how I keep choking up. Stay in it. Stay in it. Good, okay? And what that does is it makes that grafting plane super flat. Now I am diving into the tissue here, way behind where my graft is gonna take place. My graft is up in here, if you remember. This, this little nub right here, that's the branch that we cut off. And that graft started just prior to the branch and ended just after the branch. So this is my area where I wanna make sure I have a 50-50 reduction of the tissue. When I start to look at the side of it, I'm assessing, have I shaved off 50% yet? Or have I uh, you know, undershot the mark? I would say I'm about 60% uh, of the way to where I wanna be. So I'm gonna come all the way back here. I'm gonna start again. And again, this needs to stay as one beautiful singular plane. Nice and clean, okay? Nice and clean. That looks really good, okay. Now, I'm gonna stop coming all the way back to here because I'm starting to get down to the thickness that I want right here, and I'm gonna start to catch up. See that little dip right there? I'm gonna enter right here so that I flatten out that dip just a bit, but I want this to be one single layer of wood thick and now I wanna be really starting to refine my graft. Now the more that you nibble at this, the worse it's gonna get. But now when you look at the girth here, and you look at that girth here, we're getting roughly into that 50%. We might be a little shy. I have a little bit of a, a, of a branch removal that occurred quite a while ago. There's plenty of tissue on the backside here, excuse me. There's plenty of connected tissue on the backside here. I wanna to avoid touching all of this, but I think I wanna give it one or two more passes with a very light touch, but this is where you can really ruin a graft, okay? You need the sharpest part of your blade and you wanna be making a confident thin pass. If you do not have an absolutely sharp blade, you need to get a sharp blade for this piece because this confident thin pass, this is really when you can kind of jeopardize all the work you've done and there's really no coming back from it, okay? Nice little clean touch there. That one felt really nice actually. Both sides are completely intact and really, really smooth. I look across the cross section of my graft. There's no tears in the wood. I see the delineated lines of the cambium and the phloem inside of there. And let me just show you that. See how clear that is? How much you can, how much you can see that cross section of wood. And you see that white line right along the bottom there, just inside of the bark. You can even see the green line where it connects the cambium and the phloem connect to the xylem. The xylem is the yellowish core wood, okay? I feel good with that. I feel really, really good with that. I know that that is going into my grafting site here. I've already adjusted uh, my root system to accommodate the watering. 
Everything about this seems like we've set ourselves up for success. Now that I have that, I need to come back to the native. Now this is a little bit more compromising, a little more challenging, because with the native, we recognize, all right, we don't have any sort of room for error in grafting in this native area. We don't get to reshave, we don't get to get a new scion. This is kind of our only moment. So we've gotta be super on point. We refined a little bit of our grafting approach, a little bit of practice, a little bit of warm up. Okay, I'm gonna get rid of the wires that are sort of in the way of the process. I'm gonna to try to keep the wires that allow me to utilize the current shape. Okay, let me see, can you see through there, Lonnie? Okay, and let me see if I can rotate here. Is that better? Okay, so I'm going to, and this one is just a little bit in the way, so I'm gonna take that piece down and out. And I'm gonna rotate just slightly over the top here. Okay, I'm gonna start, let's start with just a nice, clean, cut across the top of this. Come on now. Okay. Like that. This is a piece of wire. Okay. That's good. I don't know what that was. Maybe I knocked off a piece of dead wood. Okay. Maybe we can edit that part out. Get in here. Just open up that elbow. Just open up that elbow. Good. Okay, now I wanna get down to as long of a run as I can possibly make. The longer the run, the better my success rate. Okay. But I can't structurally jeopardize that branch, right? So this is just a very, very, very slight grafting site here. Very, very, very slight grafting site. Okay, and I'm gonna say, because I'm on the outer elbow and I shaved off that outer elbow, that's probably about as much as I get to take off of that piece. Let me see if I can get just a little bit more run down into this region here. Yeah, I like that, that's good. That's nice. Oh. Good. Oof. <sighs> okay. A little stressful. A little stressful in these old battered branching junctions and scenarios. Okay, so I'm going to have to hit this double A spot on because I've got cambio layer exposed on two sides for roughly three quarters of an inch. Okay, now I'm going to get my electrical tape ready. I always like to use the rim of the pot. I don't want to leave myself too long of a run of electrical tape because it starts to become precarious. It gets caught in things too short and you get right to the point where you're getting tension and you run out, okay? So in general, my electrical tape runs are typically four to five inches long, just as a guesstimation of, uh, of length that, that I've come to find a comfort zone in, okay? So I'm gonna very, very carefully, this is shaved down fairly significantly, I'm gonna very carefully feed this through because we can shave these down to a point where they're so incredibly thin and, and sort of uh, malleable that, it's, that it's, it's, it's delicate, it's delicate to handle them, okay? And I wanna refine that curvature that motivated us to be grafting in this region. Okay, I'm gonna find that marriage point. Now, I don't wanna fuss with this too much. I've gotta kinda line it up, I've gotta dial it in, and then I've gotta, I've gotta get it together. I don't wanna sit here and, and, and abrasively merge these cambial layers together or else just the, the action of constantly trying to figure out how to get them together can really damage the sites. And what I'm seeing here is I'm having a little bit of an angle discrepancy. I've got good marriage of tissue, a little bit tough to see. I'm gonna hold my position here. 
Okay, and this is all about dexterity at this point in time, okay? Now, if I give myself too much of a tail on my electrical tape, I have no chance for the electrical tape to actually wrap on itself. So I just wanna give myself a real minimal amount of tail, okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna flex my branch to, to accommodate the arc that exists inside of the, the natural branching form but I've got to get my electrical tape to catch because it grabs onto itself. Now watch closely here. Once I get that electrical tape to catch, make sure my graft is lined up. I pull that electrical tape and I actually use the compression of the electrical tape to cinch up my grafting site. Okay, that is what starts to combine my grafting site. And I use that, boom. That elasticity of electrical tape is one of the real advantages of using it as your grafting, uh, as your grafting um, adhesive because you can yeah, stretch it. You can stretch it yeah, and then just sucks those two pieces together. So I'm gonna get another piece here. I'm gonna grab onto the already available electrical tape. Okay, that and that had, Adhesion to already available electrical tape is one of the most important things. Now that I have the base connected, watch closely. I'm gonna flex my graft, I'm gonna stretch, and I'm gonna get that wrap with that graft flexed, okay? And here's, here's why, now watch this, okay? I'm gonna use my fingers again, I'm gonna flex the graft. Ugh. Flex the graft, yep. and then ugh, right on top of itself electrical tape, okay? So what we're doing here is we're looking at a scenario where we have something like this and there's a little bit of hole in the middle. And as I flex that graft, the electrical tape pulls that together, right? So it's just this moment where I'm kind of like this, uh, I'm actually, I'm like this, and I flex that graft and then the electrical tape pulls that together, right? That's, that's where we're at. So I've got this, I flex, Electrical tape pulls it together. To get that graft to really seat, and you're inevitably gonna be dealing with those arches in your grafts because when you enter your scion, you create a swoop. When you enter your branch, you create a swoop. When you exit your branch, you create a swoop. We wanna ideally have a long enough run to accommodate those swoops. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And if we don't, on a situation like this, super complex, very, very tight, short little run, we have to be utilizing our hands and the placement of our hands in the execution of that graph to get those two cambial layers together, okay? Once I'm finished, I wanna be looking at this situation both in terms of the branches that I need to be getting light and photosynthetic capacity to, as well as my whip, right? And I see my whip here is pretty good. This whip is gonna be very, very available for, for photosynthesis but I noticed that some of my branching here that I need to really have strength and I need to have durability in out at the tip is not necessarily ideally placed. So I'm gonna use aluminum to both bind my graft site as well as to position my branching for my native species. Typically I'm, I'm, I'm binding the position of my grafting site. I'm gonna bind the position of my native uh, pieces to be able to give them the photosynthetic efficiency that they need in the upward direction to be able to grow at a rate that is equivalent. It's equivalent to the graft. And of course, California juniper foliage has the ability to really photosynthesize and grow with a tremendous amount of rapidity. It's a very, very vigorous growing juniper. Okay, I wanna secure that graft site really nice and tight. I don't wanna overly girdle, but I want it to be nice and tight. I still have functional wire on this piece right here that I can utilize. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna come into this second piece that's kind of trapped underneath my grafting site. Let me come around here. Okay, and I'm gonna add a little bit of wire, aluminum. Okay, and you could say it doesn't have to look good, right? Because now this is just like, this is just, just for temporary purposes. No, you still want everything you do to look good. Still should look good. Same angle, same spacing. You wanna be giving this the best possible opportunity to gain the most vigor that it could gain. 
I'm going to go ahead and just elevate this into this position here. Slight elevation, slight elevation, both of those pieces outside of the realm of the tip. This lowest branch can stay exactly where it is. It has no bearing on that graph site. Good first graph to start the process. A little bit challenging on that interior piece, but heck, let's tackle it. None of these are going to be super easy. And these branches where we've got this character, I think, are going to be particularly, I'm going to take this one off. It's just right in the way of this piece that I need to get so, so incredibly healthy. OK, none of these are going to be easy. Let's just be very clear. Grafting a tree that has been styled, most challenging graft that you can do. Grafting an unstyled tree, very effortless. Now we're dealing with all the wire scars, the shapes that we've put into the branches that we're now trying to straighten out and make them accommodate grafts. It does get to be very, very challenging. OK. We're going to come back to this first one now. Now that we've accomplished that, we know that we're going to lay this piece. And I think this was that one. I think I like this thinner one just a little bit better. OK, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to clean out these little spindly pieces. Let me pull back the plastic just slightly. Get rid of a lot of these little branchlets. Get out of here. Get out of here. Prepare your material. Prepare your material. Okay, give yourself that grafting run. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this plastic back in here. Rewrap it. Okay, and I'm going to pull it back. Just a smidge so that I have a little bit more grafting site on that scion. Okay, just pull that back just a little bit. Nothing special. OK. All right. Now let's test this one. Now this one should be very, very visible here. OK, we're looking right at the top of this. I just cut this piece off. Let me go ahead and take it all the way back. OK, and now I've removed obstructions. Now, when I set this over the top and I start to look at this, I actually think that my scion is slightly too small. Right? I think my scion is slightly too small for this. OK, when I look at that native branch that I'm grafting to, it's another 20% bigger than my scion. Now, this is a good one to keep in mind because we have some skinny ones over here that we're going to be grafting to. I'm going to go ahead and set that on the side of the tree. When you find those those areas that merge, go ahead and set those aside for yourself because it is challenging to find that perfect diameter, but you want to be fairly, uh, you want to be fairly selective and fairly insistent, which is where cultivating your own material or having you know, a nice, fresh abundance of grafting material is always, always, always uh, advantageous towards being able to perform this in both an efficient and, and uh, successful way. Okay, I'm going to pull back this plastic here. To get myself a little bit more. Always trying to get more grafting surface area. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut this back here. Reduce the amount of size. Good roots. Let's see how this one looks. Ah, this one's better. This one feels much, much better. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna delineate again my margins on the side and on the side. This one's straight across the top. This is the most beautiful. OK, and now watch this. I'm just going to come in between them just so that I don't make any mistakes. OK, now the advantage to this is my root system is facing up. So I have the ability to water this. I don't have to reorient things. I see that I've got a nice clean mark with my margins delineated. I can just sit down and go to work on this one. OK, all right. So nice clean portion of my blade. I can use a blade if I do a big, thick graft, uh, I would probably change the area of my blade that I was using uh, every graft. If I'm doing you know, moderate to thinner grafts, uh, moderate graft, you could do two to three grafts with uh, an area of the blade. If you're doing really thin grafts, you probably get four or five with an area of the blade. And notice that the thinner the graft, the more effortless the process. In fact, you've got to be very, very careful. And this is where your thumb matters so much. You've got to be incredibly careful to not go too far. Okay? And if your graph starts to run like this, 
just take your blade right over the top of it, create an incision and stop that running, okay? Really nice, clean, no tears, very, very seamless. And when I look at the side of that, we've already thinned that down very significantly, right? That's a very, very slender piece of tissue. Now, when I watch this, when I look at this, you know, the flexibility there, it's, it's almost a little dangerous how flexible that is. Sometimes we can have so much foliage out here that that structure can barely support the graft. That's where we've gotta be really careful. Okay, I'm gonna very gently set that down right there. Okay, come back up to my native here. And let's see what we can do on the top of this native. Now notice that I have a little bit of a dip. I have a little inset here and then it pops back up where my branching junction is. I've already taken the wire out of that, but I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna lower this just slightly. I'm just gonna lower this with my thumb. I wanna make sure my fingers are out of the run of the razor blade. Okay, and I'm just gonna use these fingers down here on these branches. Notice that my index down here. Just using that to kind of hook these branches right here so that I can get my thumb into position and I can graduate that cut into a position that feels really, really nice. Now at the top of this, I'm just gonna shave this down a little bit more because that becomes that catch point. If we have that dip already, that upper knuckle and this upper knuckle become those catch points. I'm shaving down my catch points so that I can get as close to that contact as possible through this midsection. Really nice, sharp, nice, sharp. See, I get that layer. It's like, it's like a cheese slicer, right? You want that nice, consistent slice of cheese. Gives you a nice, clean cambium. Gives you a nice, clean layer of, of tissue. And when I run my finger, which I don't want to do this very much, when I run my finger across that, it should not have ripples. It shouldn't have ripples. It should be flat. Very, 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 very flat. Okay? All right, let's prepare our tape. Yeah, I like that length, that four to five inch length felt really, really good. I'm gonna go ahead and give myself two or three pieces here. Generally, if you give yourself two, you'll need three. If you give yourself three, you'll need two. Always wise to give yourself more than you need as opposed to less than you need. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna line up my piece here. Again, be very, very careful at this point in time. Now, I've gotta get the root system back past that graft site right here. I've gotta get my roots so they're not an impediment. Okay, and what oftentimes happens is my graft is coming, you can see my graft coming across at a different line than my native branches. That's okay. Get the base of your graft secured first, right? So my root system is out of the way. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna get my electrical tape up through these branch forks. Okay, I'm gonna get that right on the top there. I'm gonna hold that. See me holding that with my index finger? I'm gonna hold that. Make sure that I've got the base of my branch lined up. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna work. Okay, so watch this. This is the bend, this is the arc that I was telling you about. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bend my branch up like this as I'm pulling. Okay, and let me get that one secure. Now, now that it's secure, I have the ability to use that electrical tape with this bend, watch this. Make sure I'm laterally secure, boom, okay? Watch again, make sure I've got that side to side lineup. I'm gonna flex my branch, pull the electrical tape up over the top, okay? Get that side to side lineup, electrical tape up over the top. Line up, now I don't have to hold that bend anymore. I got that arc, I got that swoop, got it all buttoned up. Now I come in and I can just finish it off. Only needed one piece of tape, nice and thin. Got everything really, really dialed in. I've got a great capacity to water. Now I have this kind of overlap and I'm gonna raise these pieces up so that they have photosynthetic efficiency I'm gonna bring this piece off to the side, okay? So those are my pieces that are photosynthesizing. These are gonna be there. These were the lesser pieces. We're gonna leave those alone. We're hoping to strike pay dirt with this piece, okay? And I'm gonna give myself that aluminum wire to tie it all together.
Okay. Now, nice turns over the top of my electrical tape so that I hold that graph together. Major, major point of success. Okay, if you're not hitting with one solid wrap around that junction, tough to get a, a, a graft to take. But then I elevate the tip of that graft just so that it starts to have that sort of upward trajectory orientation, hormone load opens up the branching below it to have some opportunity and options. All the things that we need to be doing to get success in our grafting application. This to me, between this branch and this branch, preserve that dropping piece. And honestly, if only one of them takes, it's more than enough. I've given myself two opportunities. First one was a little bit rough. I would say that has a 50-50 chance. Second one, 99% chance of take. So I have a good opportunity. Both of them take. I'm super ecstatic. Only one of them takes. I've got more than enough. Let's move on. Toledo, what a scope of work that was. Um, we ended up choosing to bypass one piece, which was the second apical piece. We're gonna leave that intact because I think I'm gonna get more out of that last grafting site and a little bit of a bigger whip than the two smaller whips that I would have had. Always, you know, when you start to get into the nitty gritty of it, the decisions that you make have to be right for the tree and what's best for the tree. And um, that felt like the right decision in the upper apical region. Other than that though, the, the organization of the whips in this particular tree, compact space, dead wood everywhere, very tight working circumstances and conditions, the, the strategy to be grafting which, when, how and why was really at the crux of handling a tree. Again, a never before styled tree with all of its branches out here, so much easier than a tree that's had all of its structure compacted and brought in. And you see the abundance 
of all of the different root masses. Right now I've got one, two, three, four roots here. I've got five, six, seven roots within the branching major structure uh, of, of the tree here. One, two, three inside of there. Um, Within this small little ball in the upper apex of the tree, every single root system for all the foliar mass that's been added to this tree exists. It's a shocking amount of strategy to be able to handle this kind of changeover of foliar mass to really transform uh, this very historical juniper. So after care post grafting is a really interesting discussion because even though we've shaved down the tissue, if we do so in the spring, this tree can go back out into full sun if temperatures are 80 degrees or lower. If we're above 80 degrees, we'd probably be putting it in morning sun, afternoon shade in those hot moments until we see the tree really start to grow, add new growth in the native foliage, see the, the grafting whips uh, begin to grow, and then we can integrate it into more intense sun where we would normally want to hold uh, and cultivate a California juniper or a native juniper regardless. Um, but that, that initial, recognizing we've reduced the, the sap flow and the vascular conductivity by 50%, sometimes a little bit more on each of the two pieces means we've got to give it a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. But in the spring, optimal time for us in the Pacific Northwest right now to put it right out into full sun with temperatures in that wheelhouse of growth and allow this tree to just begin foliar growth with a lot of momentum and the grafting done so that we don't have to come back at any other time of year and really take greater pains to the aftercare of approach grafting, right? So we have, and just to recap, we're saying, listen, spring as the buds start to move, cambial layer is still tightly adhered to the xylem. We're gonna maximize the vascular movement through the, the, from the roots to the foliar mass that's occurring at this time of year for foliar production. We're gonna take advantage of that return sugar starch load in the post-hardened state, which is really where we're gonna see the grafts merge. We have a limited amount of aftercare, if any, during this time of year as temperature and daylight length are increasing because temperatures are typ typically prior to the movement and onset of growth right in that favorable range to move the tree immediately out into full sun after grafting. And we also start to recognize that if we're grafting at this time of year, the grafts take much more quickly, take with a higher success rate, and the tree is more tolerant of this kind of reduction to its tissue. Really, really exceptional time to be grafting. If we go to the grafting execution itself, we're thinking about strategy of location to get branches in the places that maintain our structural branches and our live vein uh, intact on that juniper. Okay, we're also going through that step-by-step -step process, identifying the junction where we're going to be grafting and marking it with chalk, shaving down the scion, shaving down the stock plant or our juniper in, in the container, merging those two pieces together, tightly binding them with that electrical tape and then following it up with aluminum. We clean beforehand, right? And we're constantly and continually thinking about how do we make the root system of the grafted whip capable of maintaining both hydration as well as the application of fertilizer that will help that whip grow with the kind of vigor that allows it to take with a tremendous success. These are the discussions, the considerations, and the strategy around approach grafting our junipers that have been a bonsai and we're going to redesign with a new foyer mass. Hope that built some of your skills, expanded on some knowledge that we've touched on before in this slightly different iteration of grafting. And I hope you enjoyed getting to see an iconic tree uh, take on that beginning stage of transformation. I'm really excited to see this tree evolve as an Itoyagawa juniper. Love you guys. Mwah!